I want to point to something that Tom Stoppard said about about humor. He said, laughter is the sound of comprehension. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. Right, that's good. My point would be that the comedians, this will become less and less true the more they leverage AI to figure out what people will laugh at. It will become a self-referential land of nonsense. But for the moment, while AI is decidedly not funny, and it's really terrible at being funny so far, the comedian is traversing an edge between what we are conscious of and what we are barely conscious of. And when the comedian delivers a joke that causes the room to erupt in laughter, the comedian has found something that everybody in the room is aware of, but they are not aware that everybody else is aware of it. And so the room comes to understand itself as of like mind all at once, right? That's an extremely powerful, very ancient property. Often of like mind about something forbidden. I think of that as, uh, that's often the translation of the procedural or imaginistic into the explicit, because that's, the comedian gives words, they gives words to something inchoate. It's like it's captured in the relationship between the ideas that already exists, right? And then the comedian puts his finger on it, just like someone who coins a word does. You know how all of a sudden words pop up and we need them and they'd spread like mad because they've specified something that was a gap in our propositionalization and everyone recognizes it. It's implicit. Yeah. And and, and it's funny too, eh? Because it, this is a strange thing is that it isn't obvious at all that that's, that capacity for spontaneous laughter can be gamed, you know? I mean, you can get, are there cruel forms of laughter? There are, but it's such an unconscious response, right? It's, you laugh despite yourself often. Yeah. You certainly laugh before you think about whether you should laugh. And, and in so fact, there's something, go if, ahead. if you think about whether you should laugh, then you will commit a humor sin, which is laughing at the wrong moment. It's right, interesting right, that right. there's a cost to laughing yeah, when the yeah, punchline no hasn't been delivered or after you know everybody else is laughing and it's like you're trying to cover the fact that you're not one of us. Yeah, that inappropriate laughter has been pointed out as like that's one of the things that comes up as a critique of Kamala Harris consistently, right? Is for better or for worse, she's tarred with the brush of inappropriate laughter. And you're pointing out that that's the gaming of something that's an evolutionarily designed marker of, of something like cognitive integrity. Laughter itself has been game. And I would say that actually one of the most troubling inventions that human beings have devised. This is going to sound preposterous, but one of the most troubling... Laugh track. Laugh track. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. And the idea that you can be induced to believe that something was humorous, that you did not find humorous on your own, actually starts leading the population in the direction of believing things very deeply that they would never have accepted in the first place. So it may be used just to sell, you know, deodorant and cereal on some trivial sitcom, but the capacity to induce humans to come to conclusions they wouldn't otherwise reach by making it sound as if they are in a room full of people laughing in agreement, that's a very troubling thing. Right. Heather? To go back to your quote from Stoppard, the brilliant Tom Stoppard, laughter is the sound of comprehension. Is that it? I think I agree, but I think in your telling of the story of what happens as comedians talk actually conflates two things, both of which are important. And we've been talking about the individual coming to consciousness. The comedian says something in the individual brain, they go, oh, I didn't know. That was subconscious until now, and now it's explicit. Now it's conscious. I didn't know. But there's Silly me. A, s- silly me, or, oh, God, mm-hmm. he can see that, or you know, whatever mm-hmm. it is. But then there's also the population level, and you, you alluded to this in what you said, but I think it's no less important than maybe exactly what, you know, a rally, for instance, is meant to do and exactly what we need right now. And, you know, I'm sure you experience this, Jordan. We certainly experience this, where people will come up to us and say, you know, Thank you for saying the things that you say. I don't feel alone. I, you know, I don't, I, I I don't, I didn't know. Or that I couldn't say. I couldn't say. I, I had come to understand this, but I thought I was the only one in the universe. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. taking it back to comedy in a group of anonymous people, a large group of anonymous people, if everyone laughs at the same moment, not only did that maybe bring yourself to consciousness of that thing at that moment, or maybe you already knew it, but if everyone laughs, you know, I am not alone. I am in sync. We are synchronized. We are seeing the same things. The lens through Even which with are- regard to the unspeakable. 
even with regard to the unspeakable. And so right away, that gives you a momentum and an opportunity for action that maybe you did not know was possible before. Uh, so I think that's an addition. The individual and the population are not the same. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think comedy potentially activates both. Yeah, it's the power of the room or the population that comes to understand itself as aligned. And I would point out, it's a little harder to describe this with respect to music. And I would say music has been radically distorted by technology, beginning at the player piano. But the ability to listen to music and have it be the same, no matter how many times you play it, is a very unnatural way for music to exist. Music used to be a living entity, even, you know, a, a tribe that was singing the same song that had been sung a thousand times. It was different every single time, and it was therefore capable of adapting to the changing mood of the people who were who were participating in it. So what we moderns who are drenched in music all the time, we don't even notice it sometimes. It's soundtracking some story we're watching, and we're not thinking about the fact that there's music. But what we miss being so thoroughly surrounded by music is the incredibly powerful and rarefied experience when the band or whatever it is, the musician or the band, is actually in some indescribable way tied into the audience and the room is electric and every is synced and everybody is feeling a powerful emotion and it, they know they are feeling it together, right? And they are being stimulated by the same thing and they are feeling the same way. And even if you record that thing and you play it for somebody and you say, look at how great this was, they don't get the same feeling of discovery that that room had. And it's like the comedy and it's, it's important. And it's part of why Rescue the Republic is structured around, you know, yes, the propositional, it has to be there. We have to articulate what it is that we fear and what it is that we hope. But comedy and music are much deeper mechanisms of conveying the sense of unity, which is really what this is about. It's not a political rally. This is about the unity movement, discovering that actually we value Western civilization, we fear that it is coming apart, and we are going to put our differences aside in order to participate in protecting it from what threatens it and putting it back on the course that was that we were set upon by the founding fathers. I have a friend, Greg Hurwitz, who started this messaging organization called Us, colon, the story, or U.S., colon, the story, either way. And he's been doing a lot of sophisticated polling, and he's identified a very large number of statements where there is above 85% agreement among Americans. You know, and this is actually tied into this psychopathic manipulation story that we started with, because you could imagine that, tell me what you think of this hypothesis, is that we've got three to five percent psychopathic actors in any given population. Okay, now the question is, how do they maneuver? And the answer is, well, they use language in a purely instrumental manner. So they're only after their own advancement, and even in a non-interrupable way. They're only after their own advancement. So they'll use whatever words are around to gain that end. 